Good morning. Welcome, Space Cadets. Welcome back to the MIT Media Lab for our third annual Beyond the Cradle. We're really thrilled to have you here. We hope to see many new faces in addition to our now returning veterans, our veteran Space Cadets. Today, you'll have a fantastic program of artists, scientists, engineers, authors, astronauts, explorers, and we're really excited to share this day with you. The spirit of Beyond the Cradle is democratizing access to space. And at this particular moment in time, as we think back 50 years and celebrate the anniversary year of Apollo, we are really excited to be co-designing the future of space together with you all and thinking about how we chart the next 50 years, the next half century of space exploration. A couple quick housekeeping notes for you. Throughout the day today, if you need to check the agenda, this is, uh, I think it just disappeared on me, but beyond.media.mit.edu is the agenda. We will be able to find information about our speakers, the gallery pieces that you see outside, and the workshops. We do hope you spend a little bit of time, maybe over lunch, picking which workshop you would like to go to, because we'll send you off. You have about an hour to dive deep into some really fascinating content, and then we'll ask you to come back for the plenary at the end of the afternoon. And now it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Joey Ito, director of the Media Lab, and Dr. Maria T. Zuber, vice president of research for MIT, to kick us off for the day. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Ariel. Good morning. Um, welcome to the Media Lab, which is a part of MIT. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that this, this event and the initiative that we're doing uh, is very reflective of what we're thinking a lot about at the Media Lab. So if you, just a brief history of the Media Lab, over 30 years ago, as part of the Architecture Machine Group, where they were using uh, computers, graphical computers, to help uh, architects uh, design. And one of, the, one of the ideas that the Media Lab was founded on was this idea that we could take these computers and put them on desktops and democratize access to computing and um, kick off the personal computer revolution and later uh, the internet and email. A lot of these things came out of the Media Lab. And it was a part of taking the, uh, uh, the technology from academia and government and bringing um, companies together. Another key feature of the Media Lab was we have over 90 companies that we interact with, so it's the connection to industry, but also very much about pushing uh, innovation to the edges and um, helping startups and um, artists and people who don't traditionally interact with technology um, give them access to this technology. Um, and 30 years ago, when we launched the Media Lab, it was kind of an explosion of techno-utopianism. If you remember back then with Alan Kay saying things like, you predict the future by inventing it. Some of our faculty still say that. Um, but <laughs> I, I look at the internet today and I say, wait, I thought we would just connect everybody together, we'd have world peace. And we don't. And one of the things I think the Media Lab is currently grappling with is reflecting on this techno-utopianism and saying, could we have done better? Could we have been more responsible? And if you think 50 years ago, everybody wanted their car, there were ads, it was this age of growth and prosperity. And if you think about exploration, at the end of exploration is extraction and exploitation. And I think one of the things that I think is important to do on this kind of reflection of 50 years is I think that exploration is tremendously important, but we also need to be very vigilant about what's happening. We have climate change as a result of our prosperity and our extraction and our productivity. And interestingly, it's the reflection back on Earth that helped us really understand that the Earth is this very important thing. So I, I, I think that as we go forward, um, it's important to uh, involve everyone in this conversation, but as we explore, we have to be vigilant about what we're doing out there when we go, but we also have to use that as a tool to try to fix things back down here. And, uh, and so, so to me, the, the balance, and this is what I'd love for us to talk about, is how do we keep the wonder and the joy of exploration that science brings us together with the uh, responsible uh, uh, nuance that we need in order to be reflective and not cause harm? And so not to end on such a downer, I'm going to hand it over to, to, to Maria, who will pick us up back, okay, back I'll up again. <laughs> try to, well, I'll, I'll, but I'm going to continue in, okay. in this vein just a little bit. So I think it's really interesting that very recently we all celebrated the, uh, the first commercial launch of the Dragon that went to the International Space Station. And, um, and we were all thrilled and delighted about that. And, um, and you know, it occurs to me, really uh, should we be thrilled and delighted? And, and of course, yes, but, okay. Um, I was thinking back to um, Charles Lindbergh's first flight. So his first flight was in 1927, and then um, uh, commercial aviation, transatlantic, um, started in uh, 1939. 
okay? So um, 12 years, okay? And then it, it didn't really take off because there was this uh, event called the Second World War that uh, started after that. But then after the Second World War in like 1946, commercial transatlantic navy aviation really took off, okay? So, uh, but even taking into account a world-changing event like the Second World War, um, we're still talking about like 20 years for uh, commercial aviation to, to, to really take off um, after we had the first transatlantic flight. So, um, so here we are, depending on whether we start at the launch of Sputnik or whether we start with the you know, first landing of Apollo 11 on the moon, we've had 50 years and we've now just finally put a commercial entity up at the space station. So, um, so now I'm gonna get optimistic though, because um, you know, we've had this 50 years, and, um, and I remember back to the uh, 40th anniversary of Apollo that the Aero Astro Department threw, and, uh, and you know, it was also excellent, but it was so different than what we're doing now at 50 years, um, because in the last 10 years, um, now at this event here, um, we have not just uh, the Aero Astro Department, and the physics department and EAPS, um, but we have people from all over campus. You know, we have the media lab solidly involved. Tomorrow we have the entrepreneurship conference uh, that's sponsored by Sloan. You know, we've got people at all disciplines who are going to all three days of this conference, and um, and so uh, so I you know if if we really want to take advantage of the opportunity that space provides for us. Uh, we need all the smart people, and, and we need more than just all the smart engineers and scientists. We need all the smart people in every discipline that you can conceive of, the poets, the architects, uh, the designers. And, um, and so that's why I'm so thrilled to see so many of you yesterday, today, and I hope you come back tomorrow as well. So, um, and so that's my note of optimism. So hopefully I picked it back up to, to kind of kick us off. And, um, and so now um, I have the distinct honor to, um, to introduce uh, our keynote speaker here, Professor Sam Ting. So Sam um, shared the Nobel Prize in 1976 for his discovery of the J particle. And, um, and you know, you can only get the Nobel Prize uh, once, okay, but Sam has had multiple discoveries over the course of his career that, uh, including what I think you're, you're gonna hear about, um, uh, but he, uh, he looked at the size, uh, really defined the size of the um, electron family, uh, and he had um, you know, really important um, uh, detections of antimatter, and I could go on and on, um, but what we're here um, to hear him talk about today uh, his, is uh, his, uh, a little bit of the results, but the, the story of the alpha magnetic uh, spectrometer. So yesterday, those of you who listened to Thomas Zerbuchen's talk, Thomas talked about uh, the, the issue of, is there really great science happening at the space station? And he talked about the amazing science that was happening outside the space station and the poster child for amazing science happening outside the, the uh, space station uh, is, uh, is Sam's work um, on the AMS. Uh, it's an international collaboration with over 500 scientists involved. And, um, and for the young people um, in the audience, um, this is a story that is not just a scientific story. It is a story of perseverance uh, and keep to itness. Sam needed a dedicated shuttle flight to deliver his uh, experiment into orbit, and it's not easy to get a shuttle flight, okay? <laughs> well, it's impossible now, <laughs> but, <laughs> but even at the time, it, it, it was very, very difficult. And Sam um, really motivated and, uh, by the science, and, and the interesting thing is that AMS, you know, when you're going into higher energy regimes in physics, you really don't know what you're going to discover. I mean, you, you know, I mean, every time we look in a place we haven't looked before, we make discoveries, but it's you know, often difficult to uh, make a pitch to sell 
something when you don't know what it is you're going to get at the end. And, and that, of course, is the, the fundamental nature of basic science. And to do it at the scale um, that Sam has done and to lead an international collaboration, um, you know, all of you uh, young people in the audience who are contemplating careers, um, think about uh, the effort that went into. And uh, that's what it takes to succeed at the highest level. So happy to introduce Sam now to come up and speak to us. Thank you.